Hi everyone, my name is Grace Pankratz and I'll be talking to you today about sexual health education aimed at children. A lot of times parents assume that their child is getting education in school, but oftentimes starting in school is too late when you talk about sexual health education. In terms of starting young, it's really important because children are the backbone of our future and so when we start working with children early, they'll grow up and that will transition on to affect everybody else that they interact with throughout their entire life. Also, our textbook doesn't really focus on talking to children about sexual health. Um, we mainly focused on talking about adults or college-age students since we are college-age students. And so I thought it would be really interesting to examine sexual health education aimed at children. In terms of talking about sexual health education in schools, um, there was a study done in New Brunswick, which is in Canada, so it may or may not be per pertinent to the United States. There was a group of 4,200 parents who had children in the educational system in New Brunswick schools, and 94% of those parents agreed that sexual health education should be provided in schools and 95% felt that it should be a shared responsibility between school and home. So almost all parents felt that sexual health education should begin in elementary school or middle school, um, but there was some disconsensus on what grade level it should start in. But the majority of parents supported the inclusion of a broad range sexual health topics at some point in a school curriculum, which includes topics um, considered controversial, such as homosexuality and masturbation. Although parents indicated that they did wish to involve their they did wish to be involved in their child's sexual health education, most of them hadn't discussed it at home, and they didn't really give a lot of details to their child what sort of education they should be expecting in schools. These parents also indicated that they wanted more information from the schools about what sexual health education should be included in a home curriculum, and then how to properly teach it. So then using information about population data from the National Survey of Family Growth, which was in the United States, they found there is a reduction in the U.S. adolescents' receipt of formal sexual health education, which means that in the United States, sexual health education in schools is decreasing. And that was between 2006 and 2010, and then again from 2011 and 2013. And although formal receipt of sexual education from parents is um, appears to be stable, these rates are really low, and so parental supported information cannot be adequately compensated for gaps in school districts. Um, and then additionally, only um, 35 states have opt out provisions for sexual health education, which means parents sign a permission slip saying their child doesn't receive information, and it was found that about one to four percent of students opt out of this education, which means those students wouldn't be receiving any formal sexual health education in school. And so the only education they would be receiving is from parents at home, which is why it's very important that these students get covered. So doing a quick Google search of images aimed at parents talking to their child about sex, you see all of these children's picture books that pop up, and they're all unique in their own way and what they focus on, but none of them are standardized with a school curriculum. None of them talk um, specifically to a certain age group. They all are taking children's books and creating sexual health information within that, hoping to stimulate a conversation between parents and their child, which may or may not be successful dependent on which information is inside the book. So depending on the publisher, you could be producing whatever agenda you wanted to, whether it be a pro-sex agenda, whether it be an anti-sex agenda, that's all up to whoever wrote the book. And from these pictures and these covers, you can't really tell which, though, which side of the argument it's going to be on. So because there's so much information that's on the web about sexual health education, I am aiming to break down the ages and stages that go along with child development and what would be stage appropriate in order to talk to children about sex and sexual health education per each stage. So we're going to start early and we're going to talk about children from birth till two years old first and then we'll move on to all of the other stages. So starting here, Parents are often very surprised to find out that their children are sexual beings from birth, 
Reflexively, infants are curious about their bodies and they'll often touch their genitals during bath time or diaper changes and this is completely normal. As children get more and more familiar with their bodies and what feels good, they also might begin to masturbate often and openly. Because toddlers have no sense of privacy or social norms, sexual health education expert Tara Johnson recommends that parents gently remind their child that masturbation is not allowed in public and they need to keep their hands outside their clothing when surrounded by other people. The goal here is not to shame the child for his or her actions, but rather to explain that masturbation is healthy and normal and that it is something that should be done in the privacy of his or her own room. Additionally, it is never er too early to start teaching children the correct names for their body parts, including their genitals. Med Hickling, a sexual health education expert from Vancouver, explained that it's confusing for children to have cutesy names for some body parts and not for others. She recommends teaching your child the correct names for their genitals, including penis, scrotum, vulva, vagina, and anus, so they have no overwhelming shame or shyness around these body parts versus their other body parts. So as toddlers grow into preschoolers, so, and that's typically ages three to five years old, they grow from curious about their own bodies to curious about other people's bodies. They begin to notice details that are different between their body and other people's bodies, such as being circumcised or uncircumcised while playing out in the sprinkler. If children are not explained why these details are different, they are in a stage where they're likely going to make up a magical story to explain why these things occur. So one common example of this would be a child make, may make up a tale as to how babies are born because they were never told a correct answer. Um, without proper explanation, they may think that if you want a baby, all you have to do is walk into a hospital and a nurse will hand one out to you. Um, and that's their frame of reference because that's all they've ever seen. It becomes very important to answer all these questions that a preschooler might have, but to avoid complicated answers above their level of understanding. So you just have to answer questions um, truthfully, but without going into a crash course in obstetrics. So to answer such question, where do babies come from, um, Johnson recommends saying that a seed from daddy and an egg from mommy come together and they grow inside a special place in mommy's tummy called a womb. Johnson stresses that during this stage in life, it remains important to reinforce correct names for body parts and private versus public behaviors. It is also important, and she recommends teaching the differences between good and bad touch here. Um, this is really the first time that children are interacting together out in a public setting, such as preschool. Um, and so children need to know that their genitals are private and nobody should else be, should be touching them except for mom, dad, or the doctor. Children ages six to nine years old vary widely in curiosity about the facts in life. Some of them may just be starting to ask where do babies come from, while others may be moving on to being curious about what sex is. Hickley's standard response to what sex is is that sex is when a man puts his penis inside the woman's vagina and it's only for adults. Here, it's important to note that if you haven't properly set up the correct name for the body parts, Hickley's answer won't make much sense to these children and they won't understand the concept of sex. She emphasizes that children are not old enough to be super embarrassed to the point that it's the perfect window for opportunity to talk about sexual concepts and puberty. Um, they haven't really been socialized to feel shame around these topics because they don't know what they are. So answering straightforward questions is very important for this age group. She recommends that if you use teachable moments that could otherwise be easily ignored, a child will learn from these um, via a shadowing mechanism. So for example, if your child finds a tampon on the ground in an amusement park, you could easily use it as a jump off point to begin a conversation around menstruation, whereas otherwise it would be easily ignored and then you have to initiate that conversation from scratch, which is going to be much harder later on. During this stage, children honestly don't know the answers that they're asking you about, so you don't have to run away from explicit or adult topics because they don't understand that these are explicit or their question isn't something they would typically be asking. She suggests that if you take a deep breath and answer these questions matter-of-factly so your child doesn't assume your silence or awkwardness equates the subject to be taboo. So, if an eight-year-old, for example, asks what a blowjob is, she recommends you ask or answer that oral sex is when two grown-ups make love and they put their mouths on each other's genitals. 
Hickley says, even if you're caught completely off guard, just to promise your child you'll get back to them and then actually follow through and get back to them within a few days. Additionally, is it important to note that some children may never ask sexual questions um, and in these instances, a parent must initiate sexual education so the child still receives these informations even if they're not seeking it out. During the ages of 9 to 12, tweens typically go through a phase where they think sex is gross and the parents are gross for talking about sex. They often project that they know everything about sex even if they're using sexual slang among their friends incorrectly. This is also a stage where the majority of tweens begin to experience hormonal changes related to the start of puberty and it's important for parents to teach their child that all the physical and emotional changes they're experiencing are normal. Additionally, parents are recommend to emphasize that not all bodies change in the same way or at the same pace. So while that their child's friends might be also going through puberty, it might look or feel different for said friend. Hickley also recommends taking some time to talk about the overwhelming emotional changes that occur during puberty. She recommends having difficult conversations in the car due to it being easier to talk about the pressure of puberty without needing eye contact. Um, start by talking about the physical and emotional risks of becoming sexually active too soon and then to make it sure that a child knows that they can get pregnant the first time they have sex and that even though they can't get pregnant from having oral sex, they can still have serious STDs. Hickley remembers, reminds parents to continue to have teachable moments with their child and so if you're watching TV or a movie, you can use this as an opportunity to talk about the movie you're watching and whether or not the sex scene that was shown in it was realistic, ask whether or not they used contraception, um, and she says that parents have to be explicit about what their families are and what you expect from their tween. When you talk about future expectations, such as being a good person and being kind to men and women, it begins to associate the child's behaviors with family values, which then builds a strong sense of family and connection. During the teenage years, um, children and these are teens now, they're experiencing big life changes. Their hormones are in overdrive and they may feel pressure to have sex, even if they're not necessarily ready. While they may often not admit it, teenagers typically still want support and guidance from their parents because they're experiencing these changes firsthand and they're new to them. Continue to reinforce normalcy and behaviors in teens and while they may be feeling um, different inside, parents really play a role in addressing normalcy to their children. It is important to your seat. It is important for your teen to understand while they may see sex saturated in media, um, it's not real, and then the majority of young people are not sexually active. Here is where Johnson recommends talking about sexual consent to your teens and that nobody has the right to pressure them into sexual involvement. She explains that you want your child to learn about sex in the context of feelings and relationship, not just disease prevention. So you're taking it past the clinical step at this point, and you're talking about the larger picture of what feelings and relationships accompany sex. It is important to address the issue of birth control to your teen, um, and it should be clear how it's used and where they can get it, regardless of their gender. So studies show that well-informed teens are the ones who wait longer to become sexually active, and they typically use contraceptives when they do begin becoming sexually active. Johnson concludes her advice to parents with saying you can no longer control and dictate your child's actions. Just as much as you may want to, your help is um, what you can do to help your child is to take responsibility for their actions and give them the information they need to make a sound decision. Researcher Brooke Winner concluded that promoting the use of long-acting reversible contraception options among teens allowed for the highest reduction in unintended pregnancy due to the low failure rates of these devices and the elimination of participant misuse. Teens need to be taught that although these long-acting long acting reversible contraceptives are very effective at preventing pregnancy, condom use in tandem to these methods still remains the only way to protect against STIs. Lastly, during this age stage, it is important to note that Metzler found that adults or adolescents whose peers were reported to engage in diverse problematic sexual behaviors were more likely to also engage in risky sexual behavior. 
Thus, this is a time where peer influence is very determinative to how teens view sexual activity standards. So we're going to lastly talk about one thing that should be addressed across all ages and stages, no matter how old your child is. One of these things that typically happens somewhere in a child's lifetime is they stumble either accidentally or intentionally across pornography. And one of the first things that needs to be explained anytime a child asks or stumbles across pornography from a parent is that it's staged and it's not the way real adults behave. Um, Hickley explains that parents need to teach their children to delete it on the computer and they need to know that having sexual relationships don't mean they have to do those things themselves. So they can see these things in pornography and that doesn't mean that normal people do them, or it doesn't mean that they don't do them, it doesn't mean that they feel pressure to do these things. What's the main thing to get across is that children have a choice and they never have to do anything they don't want to do sexually. Additionally, here um, you may encounter discussing pornography with your teenager and allowing your teenager to know that while the desire to watch porn is normal, it shouldn't be shamed. Watching it in public or in the family computer is not in line with your family values that you established earlier in their age stages. Explicit media specialist Levine also recommends discussing the concept of revenge pornography and child pornography with older teens who may be exposed to these underage photos via school checks chains or from their boyfriends and girlfriends is really appropriate during this stage, typically because they're going to come across it anyways during this stage and so you need to have the discussion before preemptively so that it doesn't negatively affect the child later. We're going to conclude with talking about some harmful or uncommon sexual behaviors. Parents need to be aware of any of these red flag behaviors that appear more than harmful curiosity. There are certain sexual behaviors that can pose risk to a child's health and the health of other children. And additionally, some of these behaviors may signal that your child had been exposed to sexual or physical trauma. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that any sexual behavior or problem that occurs frequently and causes emotional or physical pain to the child should cause a parent to address the problem via a visit to a skilled professional. They found that children typically aren't going to induce pain on themselves, even if it causes them pleasure. And thus, if your child is doing something like this, you should visit a skilled professional to figure out what can be done to either prevent it or diagnose the problem. Additionally, any non-age appropriate play or play that stimulates adult sexual acts should be seen as cues that your child need to visit um, a child psychologist for evaluation. Children don't know what adult sexual acts are, so they shouldn't be able to act them out. Even if you're talking to them about what sex is, and that a penis typically goes inside a woman's vagina during heterosexual sex, a child wouldn't be able to act that out. So it signals that they've seen it somewhere, and then they would want to be evaluated to see what happened. The American Academy of Pediatrics also wants parents to know that asking for help simply means you want the best for your child, and you want to do whatever you can to help them succeed. They don't want parents to feel that there is a stigma associated with getting help for your child, even if it is related to sexual health. Um, a lot of times abuse surfaces in these situations, so parents fear removal of the child for unjust reasons, and the Academy for Pediatrics wants to reassure children that nothing like this would ever happen if there wasn't cause, um, and the main thing is to protect the child. So I want to thank you for listening to this presentation about sexual health education among children um, throughout the age stages that is appropriate for their learning. I know it's an interesting topic and a lot of parents don't feel comfortable talking to their children about sex, but that's why it's so important to do so. We don't want to um, introduce stigma around an unstigmatized topic early on, um, which would then fuel children to feel stigma as they grow older. So at this point, I'm going to end the presentation, um, and I encourage you to ask any questions about it on the Moodle site. Um, it is really interesting, and I know it was something that I didn't talk about as a child, so it is generational. And so hopefully by making it more aware to parents as we grow older, and new children, and new parents, and we can sort of erase the stigma around sex through conversations early on, um, and then propel children to be healthy sexual beings at all stages of their life.